At first I was afraid, what could the answer be? It said given this position, find velocity. So I tried to work it out, but I knew that I was wrong. I struggled, I cried, a problem shouldn't take this long. I tried to think, control my nerves. Well, welcome back. We've got a nice quick topic today. Um, and it's going to be basically a review problem from an old calculus free response question. So one of our goals is really to just get down the lingo of our course. The short answer, as most people would call them in our course, are going to be called free response. Um, so just get used to that terminology. Terminology. Now, this is a fairly old question. It's from 2002, um, and it is definitely calculator active. So I've got the whole question laid out here for you. There's just an A, B, and C. And you'll notice they don't give you the functions. It's a nice area volume question. So let's go ahead and read it, and um, you know I'll show you what runs through my head, and hopefully you're thinking the same thing. It says, let f and g be the functions given by f of x equals e to the x, and g of x equals ln of x. A, find the area of the enclosed regions uh, between x equals 1 half and x equals 1. So first and foremost, you should be grabbing your calculator and sketching this out. Now I know certainly these are two easy functions. Maybe you're, you're smart enough to do it without a calculator. I would hope so at least. Um, but let's go ahead, pause me, and get a nice picture sketched out of these functions from 1 half to 1. So again, pause it, try it on your own. Well, hopefully your sketch looks similar to mine. Um, and again, I've shaded in the area that's bounded by those four curves. So I've got my one half, my x equals one half, x equals one, e to the x and ln of x. And I just labeled, of course, those two major points on e to the x and ln of x. So all part A wants is for us to find the area of this section uh, that we have shaded in there between the one half and one. So hopefully a very simple idea when I see area, I think that just tells me to integrate. And I'm always saying upper minus lower. Okay, so let's be very careful. Let's go ahead and draw our slice in. Okay, vertical slice, of course. And do a quick sweep. Is this top of the purple always going to be on the red? And I would say yes. And is the bottom of the purple always going to be on the green? And I would say yes again. And that's great for us. That just tells us we have one simple integral. All right, so our area equals the integral. Lower bound, remember this vertical rectangle can move to the left and to the right. And basically, I'm going to say, how far can you move this to the left? And hopefully you're saying till x equals 1 half. And how far to the right? Hopefully you're saying till x equals 1. So I'm having my lower bound of 1 half, upper bound of 1. And again, upper minus lower. My upper is on red, which is e to the x, minus my lower, who's on the green line, which is the ln of x. Close my bracket, dx. Okay, so remember, area is strictly just upper minus lower. Now, what is fair game on our exam? You'll notice here that they called e to the x f of x, and they called ln of x g of x. You will still get credit if you wanted to say area equals the integral 1 half to 1 f of x minus g of x dx. That is still fair game, and you will get credit for that as long as the exam itself called it f of x and g of x. The only thing that's not allowed is for you to actually write down like y1 minus y2. If they name functions, that's fair game. So at this point, um, I would hope that this is in y1, and I would hope that this is in y2. Go to your calculator, type it in, and hopefully we'll get the same answer. Remember, three decimal places, and make sure you're in radian mode. And I get a nice answer of, whoops, 1.223. Okay. All right, so hopefully part A you're feeling pretty good about. Moving on to part B. All right, for part B, find the volume this time of the solid generated when the enclosed uh, by the graphs of f and g between x equals 1 half and x equals 1 uh, is revolved around the line y equals 4. So you can use that same picture, obviously. We haven't done too much of it. But we do have to draw on the line y equals 4. Okay. So hopefully it's very obvious to you that we are perpendicular to y equals 4, so we are a vertical slice. And again, I want to be very clear, that is the only rectangle that should be in your picture. One rectangle. The rest we're drawing are brackets. 
and this y equals 4, I'm hoping that's very clear as a washer. Do you see this whole gap here? Okay, unless this whole shaded area was sitting directly on there, we have a washer. All right, so the volume formula for a washer, of course, is pi, the integral of big R squared minus little r squared. And that should probably be on your paper, okay? All right, so now I'm going to draw my brackets in to describe big R and little r. And again, there's only one rectangle drawn in the picture. The rest are brackets. So I'm going from one end of my rectangle to the axis of rotation. That is big R. And I'm going from the other end of the rectangle to the axis of rotation. That is little r. Okay, so again, please don't draw other rectangles in. The only rectangle should be in that shaded region. So volume equals pi. Uh, my bounds are going to remain the same, 1 half to 1. And now very carefully, big R, you're always saying upper minus lower. So my upper end is on 4. My lower end is on the green ln of x. 4 minus the ln of x squared. So that's big R. Minus, now to get little r, I'm going to describe little r. The upper is on 4. The little is on e to the x. 4 minus e to the x, that quantity squared. Don't forget, some of us get a little sloppy. I'm going to squeeze it in there. Don't forget your dx there. That'll cost you a whole point. And then again, straight to the calculator. Be very, very careful how you type it in. Um, you know, I've showed it to you a million times on here. I'm not going to write it out again. But you try it on your own, see if we get the same answer. And I end up with a nice 23.609. Okay, so remember, use y1, y2, and I will round that last decimal. All right, just one more part to go. All right, now they threw a little twist on us. They're telling us there's this new function h, and that's given by h of x equals f of x minus g of x. Find the absolute min value of h on the closed interval 1 half to 1, and the absolute max of h on the closed interval 1 half to 1. Show the analysis that leads to your answer. So basically, this analysis, obviously, they're just saying show work. All right, we're not going to give you any credit without work. All right, so to me, find that key calculus word. Okay, I think there's something you can grab out from there, and hopefully you're, you're highlighting it and you're saying it's the word absolute minimum. Okay, so every time you see, and of course maximum as well, every time you see the words min and max in calculus, what should be popping to, into your head, hopefully you're saying it at home here, you should be saying set the derivative equal to zero. Okay, and that should be on your paper, the derivative equal to zero. So the first thing that you will actually get a point for is for saying h prime of x has to equal zero. Okay, missing that piece of information again is going to cost you a point. They want you to know the derivative equals zero. All right, now this is very simple. Um, h of x is nothing fancy. It was just f of x minus g of x. So h of x equals f of x minus g of x. Take its derivative. Maybe you've done that already. h prime of x equals f prime of x minus g prime of x. And show that you're setting it equal to 0. All right. Now, you could leave it like this, but to me what makes the most sense is probably to take this negative value and add it over to the other side. So I'm really going to say f prime of x. If I add that over, I would get equals g prime of x. And I think that's very simple to solve. I need f prime equal to g prime. Well, let's go back and recall. I believe f of x was e to the x, and g of x was equal to the ln of x. So go ahead, write down their two derivatives, and set them equal. So hopefully you know the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. And if you can't solve that by hand, um, go ahead, grab your calculator, and you'll probably need to do that. If two things are equal, and the easiest, easiest way is to graph them, you are basically looking to see where they intersect. Okay, so if any point in the calculator section you can set two things equal, you want to do it. Graph those two functions, see where they intersect, and I'll check back with you in a minute. I get a nice value of x equals 0.567, and again, I just graph them. Grab that intersection point on your calculator. Now, we're not done there. This is just a possible point. Uh, let me scroll back up real quickly and just verify this question. It does say it wants an absolute min and max, and they gave me a closed interval test, and they even used the word absolute. So you've got to be thinking in your head, set the table up. Okay. 
So we're almost all the way done here. I'm going to set up my table. I believe I had one half point five six seven and one. So again, these two are my endpoints, and this was my intersection point when the derivative equals zero. Okay, so I'm going to label this x, and it's very simple who you label this with. Just use common sense. Who are you trying to find the absolute max of? Well, that would be h of x. So that's who you're going to plug these into. And remember, h of x was just equal to f of x minus g of x. So h of 1 half is equal to f of 1 half minus g of 1 half. Okay, now on my calculator screen to get that answer, I'm actually, I have this in y1, so I'm saying y1 of 1 half minus y2 of 1 half. And again, make sure you're, you're playing along, so to speak, at home. I got a nice answer of 2.342. And then I'm going to do the same thing for each of these. h of 0.567, which is really f of 0.567 minus g of 0.567. Obviously, you get the idea. And the same thing for h of 1. And then my goal is just to compare those answers. And I've got 2.330 and 2.718. Now, lastly, just make sure you actually answered the question. Um, they asked for an absolute max and an absolute min. Now notice they didn't say where, they actually want the values. So I would say my absolute max is 2.718, and my absolute min is 2.330. And that actually answers our question. Now, real quickly, before you, you finish here, um, I want you to look at one other thing real quickly. Every question has a rubric that goes with it, and that's how you will be graded on. So in part A, um, the point system is off to the side here. And what they're looking for is on the left here. So you got one point for the integral and one point for the answer. Now, I mean, just take your time. If you miss a dx on here, you lost the whole point for the integral. All right, and we cannot afford to do that. This area volume question, we've got to nail perfectly. Um, in the second part B, uh, it says limits and constant. Limit actually means your bounds. Okay, do you have the bounds and the constant of pi? That alone was worth one point. So even if you screw up the integral, you would still get a point if your limits, your bounds, and the constant was correct. You got a second point for the correct integral, or integrand. And notice you lose one point for each error. And then one point for your answer. All right, so that's a total of four points altogether. Um, so again, you've got to nail that. That's a six out of nine, and you really got to nail this last section. Again, here's that one point just for setting the derivative equal to zero. Perhaps you screw everything else up, but you can still get a point just for saying you knew the derivative equal to zero. The second point was that critical point, 0.567. So if you just got to that point and got stuck or time ran out, you got a point. And then one point for your answer. So all this work on this absolute table, even though it was a ton of work, it actually only ended up being worth one point. And again, you actually had to state your answers. So the point distribution, you know, is a little goofy and it's changed over time. This is a fairly old problem. Um, but, you know, I just want to show you that there is lots of credit you can get just for setting up the correct integral, getting the bounds and the constant correct. There are a lot of points to earn. So that does it for tonight. Have a great night and we'll see you tomorrow.